1940, the most deadly year. Amid the torrent of violent events, one anxiety reigns supreme. Battles might be won or lost, territories might be gained or quitted, but dominating all our power to carry on the war, or even keep ourselves alive, lay our mastery of the ocean routes and the approach and entry to our ports. Britain was still in the ring. We had shown the world that we could hold our own. 1940, the most deadly year. In our long British story, our survival was secured through the domination of the seas by the British Navy. The domination of the seas. It was a great, quaintly organized England that had destroyed the Spanish Armada. The domination of the seas. There was the long struggle against Napoleon under the classic leadership of Nelson. The domination of the seas in the First World War. Jellicoe, Beatty, the Battle of Jutland, the last great surface encounter between two great fleets. And now, 1940. Britain's lifeblood seeps away as desperately needed cargoes fail to reach British ports. We all realized that the life and war effort of the country depended upon the weight of imports safely landed. I, James Munro, Stepney, London, been to sea 50 years, torpedoed twice, at Lynchfield, home, Surrey, to recuperate when we sea again. Jerry has got a U-boat to sink me, I'm still game to go again. The losses inflicted on our merchant shipping became most grave during the 12 months from July 1940 to July 1941. Grave anxiety and heavy losses. In Berlin, Hitler says, and they will notice that we have not been sleeping. The Axis powers can never achieve their object of world domination unless they first obtain control of the seas. plans depended upon the defeat of this menace. Here was no feel for gestures or sensations, only the slow, cold drawing of lines on charts which showed potential strangulation. The mortal danger to our lifelines gnawed my bowels. I said to Admiral Pound, I am going to proclaim the Battle of the Atlantic. This, like featuring the Battle of Britain nine months earlier, was a signal intended to concentrate all minds and all departments concerned upon the U-boat war. Help from across the ocean had been confined to supplies. But now, in this growing tension, the President, acting with all the powers accorded to him as Commander-in-Chief, began to give us armed aid. raw design for the joint defense of the Atlantic Ocean by the two English-speaking powers began. Now, well, gentlemen, the senior officer of the escort will say a few words to you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, gentlemen. This is how you can help your escort. Don't straggle or romp ahead, because I cannot afford to detach an escort for a few ships and thus weaken the protection for the whole convoy. If you spot a U-boat, give him all you've got. Your splashes and your traces at night will act as a good pointer, and you never know, you might hit it. <laughs> Finally, if a serious attack develops, do not let us forget this. U-boat commanders 
Don't sail in to attack with a happy heart. For them, it is a moment of extreme tension. And if at the critical moment we can take every offensive action, we shall weaken their resolution, and they will sheer off and not press home their attack. tactics inspired by Admiral Dönitz, the head of the U-boat service, were vigorously applied by the U-boat commanders. A group of U-boats working together, attacking a convoy from different directions, usually by night. Franklin Roosevelt says, these submarines are the rattlesnakes of the Atlantic. The months from July to October of 1940 are the worst. The Germans call this the happy time. shadow of the U-boats cast its chill upon us. How much would the U-boat warfare reduce our imports and shipping? Would it ever reach the point where our life would be destroyed? To the U-boat scourge is now added the Bismarck, the most powerful warship in the world. The Bismarck leaves the Baltic and heads out to the North Sea. The Bismarck, mounting 15-inch guns, carrying over 2,000 of Germany's finest seamen. Neither the Royal Navy nor the United States Navy has any single vessel to match her. At this time, 11 convoys, including a precious troop convoy with its risk of fearful loss of life, were at sea or about to sail. 
one scene riveted my background thoughts. This tremendous Bismarck, perhaps almost invulnerable to gunfire, rushing southward toward our convoys. The Bismarck, the greatest potential killer of them all. Ten thousand miles a year. That's what I drive. It sounds like a lot of miles, but actually it's just about average. Now the high mileage driver, he covers more road in a year than some people cover in ten. His livelihood depends on his car. That's why he relies on standard oil dealers. One reason is right here. The American Final Filter. Clean gasoline's a must when you fill up two or three times a week. Another reason? There's always a standard oil dealer just ahead. That's why in mid-America, twice as many drivers choose standard over any other brand. And it's a good place for you to do business, too. Good morning, Mr. Anderson. You expect more from standard, and you get it. Standard Oil Division, American Oil Company. The Bismarck. Admiralty expected the Bismarck to come through the Denmark Strait in the early dawn, and that the Prince of Wales and the Hood, with two or three cruisers, would bring them to battle. To checkers on that Friday afternoon, May 23. Avril Harriman and Generals Ismay and Pownall were to be with me until Monday. It was likely to be an anxious weekend. I had, of course, the most complete service of secretaries in the house, and also direct telephone connections with the duty captain at the Admiralty and other key departments. We spent an anxious evening and did not go to bed until two or three o'clock. His Majesty's ship, the Prince of Wales. The cruisers Suffolk and Norfolk. The light cruisers Manchester and Birmingham. His Majesty's ship, the Hood, our largest and our fastest ship. The commander-in-chief of the home fleet deploys his ships to guard the various passages into the Atlantic. The hunt for the Bismarck was on. May 23, 1941, the heavy cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk, patrolling the icy fog-bound waters of Denmark Strait, break radio silence. I'm Captain Ellis. I was the commanding officer of the Suffolk. When the lookout hailed that he had sighted an enemy battleship, I went to the edge of the bridge because it was important to be sure that it was a battleship. There's a tendency in the fog for a ship to look much larger than she really is but it was the Bismarck. Now, it's the business of a cruiser to, uh, not to fight battleships, but to follow them until you can bring them into contact with your own heavy forces. We were ahead of the Bismarck, so I immediately altered course and increased speed to maneuver to get astern of her. We were aided in doing this by patches of fog, and within about half an hour, we were in a position following astern. As the Arctic twilight grew into day, the Bismarck could be seen on a southwesterly course. The Hood and the Prince of Wales were in sight. Mortal conflict was at hand. opened fire at 5.52 a.m. at a range of about 25,000 yards. The 
Bismarck replied, and almost at once the hood suffered a hit which started a fire in the four-inch battery. The fire spread with alarming speed. Suddenly, disaster. The hood was rent in twain by a mighty explosion. A few minutes after, she vanishes beneath the waves amidst a vast pall of smoke. The ship began to roll over on top of me and some of the wireless aerials which were loose wrapped around my feet and started to pull me down with the ship. I kicked my boots off and surfaced and realized that I was only about 15 foot away from the ship. She was sinking and had her bows in the air and going down quickly. I'm one of the three survivors of HMS Hood, which had a complement of just over 1,400. About seven, I was awakened to hear that the Hood, our largest and also our fastest capital ship, had blown up. At about half past eight, my principal secretary, Martin, came into the room in his dressing gown. Have we got her, I asked. No, and the Prince of Wales has broken off the action. But the Bismarck II is hurt. She has been struck underwater by two heavy shells, one of which pierces an oil tank. Now she can travel neither far nor fast. As long as we could hold fast to the Bismarck, we could dog her to her doom. But what if we lost touch in the night? Which way would she go? She had a wide choice and we were vulnerable almost everywhere. Under these circumstances, my American guest, Mr. Harriman, thought I was gay. But it costs nothing to grin. All day Saturday and all night, until the early hours of Sunday, British ships continue to shadow the Bismarck. Just before dawn, she disappears. Well, I was briefed to be one of three aircraft to uh, carry out searches of sectors in the Atlantic for the Bismarck. We were in cloud, but we suddenly came out into a break, and we were buffeted around the sky by a terrific amount of shrapnel, and a large number of holes started to appear in our aircraft. I looked down, and there we were, in clear sky, directly over the battleship. Uh, the fact that the ship was firing at us was uh, no proof that it was an enemy ship, as the Royal Navy had instructions to fire on all aircraft approaching too close. Um, in my experience during the war, I was fired on uh, more often by the Royal Navy than by the Germans, uh, especially if the captain had, had a good lunch. Within an hour, swordfish planes from the carrier Ark Royal locate the fugitive again. score three hits. The Bismarck is crippled. The German commander, Admiral Lutchen, had no illusions. Shortly before midnight, he reported, ship unmaneuverable. We shall fight to the last shell. Long live the Führer. On Monday evening, Admiral Tovey signals that his battleships might have to abandon the chase of the Bismarck because of a threatened fuel shortage. I told him to go on, even if he had to be towed home. Monday, May 26th, 
the crippled Bismarck is harried by British attackers. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday, May 27, Churchill has to report to the House of Commons. This morning, I said, shortly after daylight, the Bismarck was attacked by the British pursuing battleships. I do not know what were the results of the bombardment. It appears, however, that the Bismarck was not sunk. I had just sat down when a slip of paper was passed to me which led me to rise again. I asked the indulgence of the house and said, I have just received news that the Bismarck is sunk. They seemed content. started her on the port bow, and she immediately loosed off at us. My feelings were pretty mixed for a few seconds until I saw the brick drop about 40 or 50 yards away from the ship's side. And I realized then that although we'd been Bismarck, we were quite unmarked. Well, it was just nice up there, sitting down here watching things go. She was a fine looking ship, but she just couldn't take it. The destruction of the Bismarck had to be accomplished to be true to the traditions of the British Royal Navy because in the Navy I know officers and men know how to avenge the loss of those who are comrades and many of whom have been shipmates. On September 11, 1941, the President said, from now on, if German or Italian vessels enter the waters, the protection of which is necessary for American defenses, they do so at their own peril. The president went on to say, the delivery of needed supplies to Britain is imperative. This can be done, it must be done, it will be done. thankful with the way the war had gone so far. We wondered about the future, but after all we had surmounted, we could not fear it. Let us not forget that the enemy has difficulties of his own, and that the great struggles of history have been won by superior willpower, resting victory in the teeth of odds upon the narrowest of margins. Broadcasting Company gratefully acknowledges the assistance of the British Broadcasting Corporation in the preparation of this series. <laughs>